talk about modeling and predicting oncogene addiction. And my lab's been trying to answer the question, why does targeting any particular uh, gene work in curing cancer? And in particular, why and when do targeting oncogenes work to cure cancer? Why, in some circumstances, are the Achilles heel of cancer? And to me, this question has broad significance for understanding how specific genes become essential for a pathologic state. And a priori, there's no reason to think that a, a disease process as complicated as cancer targeting any single oncogene or any gene would have any profound impact. You might expect in many circumstances there'd be no consequence or there'll only be a partial consequence. And you might consider that the process was complicated because it would not only affect something inside the cell, the cancer cell, when you target an oncogene, but how it communicates with the microenvironment. And what I'll show you is that me and many other colleagues have utilized uh, transgenic mouse models as a way to explore this mechanism. And I've listed some of the authors of some of the papers uh, that have used the same strategy that I've used, including the first paper which I published as a postdoctoral fellow. Now, the idea that there really are Achilles heel of cancers and the notion of oncogene addiction is coined by Bernie Weinstein an emeritus, uh, head of a cancer center at Columbia University, so appropriate in the context. We have a lot of representation from Columbia and Stanford here at this meeting. Uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but he wrote an editorial accompanying a paper that I published in Science now a decade ago, describing this idea of oncogene addiction as an Achilles heel of cancer, that there be contexts where even briefly interrupting the activity of a single gene could permanently revoke a cancer phenotype. And I've spent the last decade dutifully trying to understand rules of oncogene addiction. When does turning off an oncogene reverse cancer? How long do you need to turn off an oncogene? Cellular development in genetic context, how that influences what happens. The role of biological programs like senescence, angiogenesis. Uh, we've developed new technologies to interrogate oncogene addiction in clinical specimens, such as nanoscope proteomic methods. We've explored the role of the microenvironment in the immune system. And most recently, we've mathematically modeled oncogene addiction in terms of simple biological processes. So I've divided my talk really into uh, uh, two major parts, really. The first part is to explain to you the biological system we've used and to uh, implicitly express this idea that to understand our question, we had to use a multi-scale approach. And then the last part of uh, my talk, I will illustrate how we use simple mathematical methods to predict oncogene addiction, and how more recently we've used comparative genomic methods to isolate small gene signatures that seem to be highly prognostic uh, and very illustrative of the mechanisms of oncogene addiction. I focus mainly on the MYC oncogene, which is a, a proto-oncogene that physiologically regulates the expression of thousands of genes. It's a transcription factor implicated in the uh, regulation of cell cycle, apoptosis, adhesion, differentiation, cell renewal, angiogenesis, metabolism, protein synthesis. So many of the programs physiologically essential for a cell, but also many of the programs when disrupted, strongly associated with cancer. To, to study how MYC causes cancer in vivo, so I could look in a multi-scale context, I've utilized the TET system. It allows me to exquisitely regulate many different oncogenes together or individually in a tissue-specific context. And the first iteration of this model, I made a model of MYC-induced lymphomogenesis. And when you turn MYC on in the hematopoietic system, these mice succumb to a very aggressive cancer that kills the host. They're genetically complicated, they're clonal, they're transplantable. But if you take this complicated, invasive cancer and turn off the MYC oncogene, you completely reverse the neoplastic phenotype, a sustained loss of neoplastic phenotype. And what we thought was happening was simple. You turn off the oncogene and cancer cells resume normal physiologic programs and they go from cancer cells to normal cells. So lymphomas become lymphocytes, leukemias become neutrophils, and then they die as part of a physiologic program. And so we thought the process was cell autonomous. And that's how we described what oncogene addiction was. And we've made many models of MYC-induced tumor genesis as well as other oncogenes, including osteosarcoma, hepatocellular carcinoma, more recently, renal carcinoma and lung adenocarcinoma, and the theme emerges. The MYC oncogene induces reversible tumor genesis, even in cancers that are very complicated, highly invasive. Turn off the MYC oncogene, the cells resume physiologic programs, 
and they lose their cancer phenotype. So we wanted to see if there were convergent mechanisms. And still at this point, we were doing this the way biologists in the past had normally thought about doing this, was by following hunches based on what had been described in the literature. And it appeared, more, uh, when we looked at the cells, that they were undergoing differentiation. And there was this notion in the literature that an essential process in tumor genesis, the regulation of cell renewal and senescence. And indeed, we found that in every context we looked, when we turn off an oncogene, the cells undergo senescence. And this is one example of an assay, beta galactosaining. We use many assays to demonstrate this point. Indeed, uh, Pierre Paolo Pandolfi has articulated this even more eloquently than us, the notion that you can use senescence as a therapeutic maneuver generally for cancer. And in fact, therapies that target oncogenes induce senescence, very much like we were able to model in our uh, transgenic systems. And we know that the process is uh, exquisitely regulated, both tumor intrinsically and as well as through uh, regulation through autocrine pathways, because if we disrupt, for example, TGF-beta autocrine signaling by using a dominant negative TGF-beta receptor, the tumors don't undergo senescence when you turn off the oncogene. We also know that the, what's going on in the host matters. So we know the tumor cells are communicating with the host, because if you look when you turn off the MEK oncogene, there's a shutdown of angiogenesis associated with apoptosis of endothelial cells. We've dissected the molecular circuitry, knowing that it's P53 dependent. It's mediated through expression of thrombospondin 1 that gets turned on when you turn MYC off, but not in the absence of P53. We also know that the host microenvironment is being regulated by the immune system, and specifically we've dissected that CD4 positive T cells, uh, cells that are thought to be T helper cells, not previously implicated in the regulation of tumor genesis in any manner such as this, play an essential role in this process. And if you're missing CD4 cells, that alone is enough to prevent turning off MYC from reducing sustained tumor regression, and it blocks the ability to induce senescence, and it blocks the ability to shut down angiogenesis. So increasingly, it's emerging that there's a multi-skill aspect to this puzzle, where the MYC oncogene regulates gene expression, but the way it confers and maintains a neoplastic phenotype is dependent on a program of senescence, and angiogenesis, tumor intrinsic, and host-dependent processes, and that the microenvironment, the immune system, is playing a role in this process as well. And so we argued this idea that there was a cell autonomous as well as a host-dependent aspect of oncogene addiction, and that it was a matter of magnitude. When you turn off an oncogene, you get very good tumor elimination, but to get complete elimination, you need the host immune system. So realizing this complexity, the multi-scale nature of this process, the idea was, could we come up with a way to mathematically model oncogene addiction by assuming that the process has converged around basic signaling states? And the reason why this is important, practically, is that you would love to be able to predict which therapies work in patients much more rapidly than simply waiting for the clinical response, which typically involves many, many cycles of therapy. So if you had a way mechanistically of telling within days or hours, or even within a week, whether or not a therapy was eliciting oncogene addiction that had profound transformative effects on the field of oncology. And we've used two mathematical approaches, and all of this work was done implicitly with David Pegg, my colleague at um, Stanford University in, um, in, in radiology. Uh, and David uh, has done two kinds of modeling, mechanistic modeling using ordinary differential equations, and predictive modeling using support vector machine. And we started actually with a different transgenic model that I've shown you, our lung cancer model, because we had an example of where turning off an oncogene did not elicit oncogene addiction as profoundly. MYC oncogene, when turned off, does not cause profound tumor regression in lung adenocarcinoma. And the RAS oncogene, where you also get an and you get profound tumor elimination. And we are able to very quantitatively measure tumor growth and regression using quantitative imaging. And this shows CT scans of mice. And you can see individual tumors. And, and below, you see the quantification of a large number of tumors. And you can see RAS and MYC similarly induce exponential growth of tumors. But if you turn off RAS, there's exponential decrease in tumor growth. The tumor regresses. In MYC, there's a linear and then there's a plateau, you do not get profound tumor regression. And so, with discussions with David, we reasoned that the simplest way to explain what was changing in tumor volume 
was a change between survival and death signaling. And we postulated there were three simple states a cancer cell could be in, growing, status quo, homeostasis, or dying, apoptotic. And then using a mechanistic model and a large amount of biological data, we solved for the relationship between survival and death signaling in this simplistic model. And what we found was, to our surprise, that the simplest explanation for what we were observing is that survival signaling was higher than death signaling in the basal state of a cancer. That's not the surprise. But the surprise is when you turned off the MIC oncogene, there was a profound, rapid decrease in the survival signaling, but there was also a decrease in death signaling, but there was a delay in the decrease in the death signaling. And it was this box, B, that is what's responsible for oncogene addiction. And we validate this in many ways. Uh, uh, and this just shows uh, more of a description of this. And this is very reminiscent of an idea that Jeff Settleman had proposed in a review uh, 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 more recently in genes development, although he proposed this actually years before this. And he called this oncogenic shock. The idea being that everything gets turned off in the cancer cell, but the survival signaling extinguishes more quickly than the death signaling, and so therefore you get tumor regression. Now, to prove, we use many approaches to try to prove this. But one of the powers of these transgenic models is we can manipulate genetically the system. And so we tried to prove what we saw in lung cancer by taking a different cancer, lymphoma, and manipulating three different gene products involved in survival of death signaling, STAT3, AKT, and PP3. And what you can see is this magic box associated with oncogene addiction was present in STAT3 and AKT. Uh, so STAT3 and AKT did not perturb oncogene addiction, and that's indeed what happened. The tumor shows sustained tumor regression. But PP3 abrogated this period where there was more uh, death signaling than survival signaling, and the tumors don't regress and reoccur. And so this supported this notion. We also looked at a large number of proteomic markers of survival death signaling and, and did the same mathematical modeling and came to the same conclusion. We've also used a more predictive modeling, and the idea was that if there's a precise kinetics that can be described of oncogene addiction, then very quickly after giving a therapy, by making very quantitative measurements in the change in volume of the tumor, you should be able to predict clinical outcome. And uh, for example, taking a lung cancer data set, we could come up with a threshold change of volume at a short interval after giving a therapeutic, a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and we could distinguish a group of better prognostic patients and worse prognostic patients with some statistical validity. Although this is not a clinical study, um, and so therefore it can only be seen as instructive not really truly uh, predictive in the, in the way that I would like as a, a clinician and an oncologist. So this has also led us to try to interrogate, can we actually identify the gene programs responsible for predicting oncogene addiction? And we've taken genomic approaches, proteomic approaches, and molecular imaging approaches, and we've tried to incorporate our, this into our mathematical modeling. And for the sake of time, I'll just show you some examples of the gene expression approaches that we've used. So um, in my laboratory, we've generated a whole series of genetically uh, deranged hematopoietic tumors that have defects in signaling process involving death, survival, self-renewal. And for example, we found that if you make a lymphoma defective for PT3 or P19R, they never show sustained tumor regression when you turn off the MIC oncogene. And when you look biologically at what's happening is there are two distinct circumstances. In the case of the loss of PP3, the tumors do not uh, uh, show, um, uh, show a defect in angiogenesis. In the case of P19R, the predominant change that you observe is that the cells are not able to undergo senescence. And, and PP3 tumors, when you turn off MEC, still undergo senescence, but the ARF tumors don't, as measured by beta-galactosidase staining and, and a cell cycle marker, uh, P16. It's just the quantification. So then we took a genomic data set based on these different tumors, and we asked which genes overlapped and were similar. And then taking advantage of our participation in the Stanford CCSB program led by Sylvia, and um, an elegant work done by uh, Sylvia and Andrew, um, to develop a precog database that has turned out to be amazingly tractable and useful to all of us at Stanford. We were able to take this data set, look at the precog data set, and we're able to identify uh, gene signatures that are prognostic for lymphoma, 
but also identify specific biological programs associated with the different genotypes. So MYC wild type, MYC P53 null, MYC P19 ARF null. And what was provocative is that the programs that appeared involved immunity, which was not necessarily what we were expecting, although I've just described to you that we'd implicated that CD4 cells uh, were implicated in the process of tumor regression. Now, the power of our model is after doing the genomics, we could then go back into the biological model and ask, could we observe a difference in innate immunity? And what you can see is the absence of, in the absence of ARF, but not in the absence of PT3, you do not get a recruitment of innate immune cells. Where you do in the wild type, in the MEC wild type, you do, and in the PT3, no, you don't. And so this appears to be part of the mechanism. And therefore, we've predicted that this innate immunity response is actually clinically important to the ability of human patients to respond to therapeutics um, who have this type of acute lymphocytic um, lymphoma. Now, this approach appears to generalize because we have made a liver cancer model and a kidney cancer model, and we've been able to identify a 20-gene signature and a 10-gene signature that are even more profoundly prognostic in these disease states and individual genes we've already been able to, via, uh, to validate as being directly causally involved in the process of tumor progression by taking our tumor system and interrogating what happens when you manipulate those genes and then measuring the um, clinical outcome in our, in our tumor models. So my laboratory has been profoundly interested in modeling and predicting oncogene addiction. We've started the idea that we need to use an organism to model what happens in, in humans because the process is a multi-scale process. We've interrogated the role of both tumor intrinsic as well as host-dependent processes, and we've incorporated different kinds of mathematical modeling and comparative genomic approaches to analyze the data. We've uncovered that oncogene addiction involves both tumor intrinsic fail-safe mechanisms as well as host fail-safe mechanisms, such as self-renewal programs and angiogenesis, and that these are integrated by a, a, an implicit role for the immune system and autocrine and chemokine signaling. And we've made simple mathematical models with our collaborators that allow us to predict oncogene addiction. And in my laboratory, this is how we dress. <laughs> and please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. We have uh, plenty of time for questions from a properly dressed individual. Okay. Please, okay. So I have a question about the generality of the oncogene addictions beyond MIC in the sense of does the cancer cells adapt upon removal of the oncogene addictions? That's an outstanding question. So can, if you, for example, if you slowly turned off the oncogene, you might think that the cancer cells could more readily adapt to the circumstance and the kinetics would matter. And you're not alone in thinking that. Um, one of the most senior world-class mouse modelers, Anton Burns, uh, from the Netherlands Cancer Institute, used to be the director there until he retired, asked me the same question when I first made the model. And boy, have I tried to look at this. But what seems to happen is when you slowly turn off MYC, it makes it very easy for the cancer cells to figure out a way to turn MYC on through another mechanism. And so the main adaptation is that it makes evolutionarily easier, very much like if you have an infection and you only take half your antibiotics, you're more likely to get drug resistance. The same thing happens in our model. And I had several rotating students do the same experiment, only to find. And we published part of this in a paper in PNAS that got the attention of all the people in the world to get the attention, got the attention of James Watson. So Jim Watson of Watson and Crick said to me, that's a really interesting paper, Dean, because you proved the tumors can't escape MYC, because when you do anything you do, and you look, what they do is they find a way to turn MYC back on. And they do anything they can, the cancer cells. They break this TET system that I've engineered. They translocate an endogenous MYC. They translocate and activate an endogenous NOTCH gene. NOTCH is a transcription factor upstream of MYC. However, I think you have to be right. 
that there have to be contexts where slowly modulating the system would allow it to adapt. And that might be a critical aspect of onco, especially if that mathematical modeling where survival and death signaling kinetics, but I've yet to be able to prove it. Okay. So if we don't have any further uh, questions, let's uh, thank Dean Fischer again.